your partner Mike Shu. We got to thinking about uh, math the other day and mathematical theories. And you know what happens when you start thinking about stuff. This is what happens. So I'm going to read the first paragraph to you just to kind of break into this. A mathematical theory is a mathematical model that is based on axioms. A theory can be a body of knowledge. And so in this sense, a mathematical theory refers to an area of mathematical research. This is related to, but distinct from, the idea of mathematical models. Branches of mathematics like group theory and number theory are examples of this. And you can see, you know, to really understand it, you got to break it down to make it simple, right? Okay. So I started thinking about how many mathematical theories are out there. This is what I found. So just take your pick. So there really is a string theory if you're into the Big Bang Theory. And it's what they say it is on the show is what it is when I looked it up. So I started thinking about, I always compare everything to Harvard because Harvard and all the Ivy League schools create billionaires. So the 10 hardest math classes at Harvard University. So physics 16, mechanics and special relativity. And it is said that it is, that it is the most difficult class that they have at Harvard. Second is math 55A, honors abstract algebra. Number three, social studies 10B, introduction to social studies. And at the end, one former student called it a truly life changing course. It's an interesting thought. Computer science 225, pseudo randomness. Number five, philosophy 129, Kant's critique of pure reason. 95% of students polled rated it as difficult or very difficult. Six, government, 1061, the history of modern political philosophy. Seven, economics, 1126, quantitative methods and economics. Eight, chemistry, 161, Statistical Thermodynamics. Nine, Medieval Latin 110, Latin Literature in the 12th Century. Uh, definitely something for doctors, I would think. History 97, Sophomore Tutorial. 91% of former students rate the classes difficult or very difficult. And then they, in all of these, they talk about the workload and all the workloads are very extensive. So, Kant's critique of pure reason, this guy was born in 1724 and he died in 1804, and his critique of pure reason lives on. He wrote a couple of books, and you have to go back and think about what it was for them and the way that they thought about metaphysics, the way they, they thought about the future like we do and the technology that we have. So seven plus five is 12. So that's a priori. The seven plus five, you know it's gonna be, it's gonna be 12. Um, it, it's a universal truth, but 12 is, is, is synthetic because it's a concept of 12. I mean, what does 12 mean? Well, you can look at it as seven plus five. But I think in this whole process, what they're looking at is the process you're you having a thought process of understanding a logical process and that, that's basically what math does math teaches you to think in a logical way about certain problems and like if you're going to send people out to mars it's probably good that there's people taking this so i thought about the time frame now you could go all the way back to the time of man too many slides. So I just wanted to show what they were doing in 1705. He was born in 1724. And, you know, they were poking around in, in, in uh, astrology. They, they, they were looking out, out into space. 1750, you had uh, a person, you can't see it behind my camera, but they were cataloging 10,000 stars in 1750. And that's about the time he would have probably been about 25 years of age. He's probably a professor at that time.
So if time and space, among, among other things, are constructs of the mind, we might wonder what is actually out there, independent of our minds. Everything leads to a logical assumption, and so this is what my summary is. Using the theory of metaphysics, 18th century analytic philosophy, by pondering the questions such as, if time and space, among other things, are const constructs of the mind, we might wonder what is actually out there, independent of our minds. Because they're looking out into space at this time, and they're trying to figure out planets, and are we here alone, and you know, how do we build something to get out there? Continued uh, of my continuance of my summary, the philosophy college professor back in the 1800s had no way to find answer, answers to his questions as we do in modern day. All pondering was mathematical in essence. You can't change math. So 7 plus 5 is 12. It's always going to be 12. You can't change it. Anecdotally, based on current and past experience of others, known writings, travels, he distinguishes sharply between the world of new menon, phenomenal attributes, which is the world of things in, in themselves, and the world of phenomena, which is the world as it appears in our minds. So they can only dream about space and the future and what's out there, but they were, catalog they were cataloging 10,000 stars in 1750. I think you had, to, you had to really understand what was real and what was what's not real. I mean, we understand by manifesting things in our mind, it will come true, but I think we have to have a, a, a very firm grip of reality. And I kind of think that's what this class teaches. I don't know. If you went to Harvard, feel free to jump in. I wonder if anybody went to Harvard in St. Lucie County. So we're going to end here. Like us, subscribe, and share to all your math friends. Uh, I'll be around. Take care. Love you.